Welcome. It's my extreme pleasure to serve as a moderator for today's Ask an MS Expert webinar. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, where I work to ensure that the perspectives and priorities of families affected by progressive MS are represented in all of the projects and work undertaken by the Alliance. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I also chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join the webinar, so let's give them another few seconds and then we'll get started. This webinar is really all about getting answers to the questions that are on your mind. So before getting underway, I want to review how you can submit your questions. If you're connecting through GoToMeeting and you joined the webinar using your personal computer's mic and speakers, you'll have the ability to submit comments and questions through the chat box that you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. Today's webinar is also being streamed live on Facebook. So welcome to everybody with us on Facebook. We have a team ready to capture your questions and comments as well. So please feel free to post them. As I chat with our experts, you can submit your questions as they come to mind. And we're going to address as many of your questions as we can. Now, I know many of you might have some very specific questions related to your own situation. Because of our limited time together, we're going to be focusing on the questions that pertain to everyone. Following the webinar, the questions that we're not able to get to will be addressed in the Society's FAQ section of their website, and you can always contact an MS Navigator to receive personalized attention to your particular question. And you'll find contact information for the MS Navigators on the MS Society's website. Now, obviously, I can't make this webinar happen all by myself. There are lots of amazing people working behind the scenes. And one of them is Julie Feel. And Julie is going to help me today by pulling together your questions in the background while I'm busy talking. We may even get Julie to read some of your questions herself. I should also mention that due to the large number of participants we have today, everyone has been placed in listen-only mode. And if you're interested in reviewing today's discussion with our experts, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the Society's website for reference. Today's Ask an MS Expert webinar is one of a series of virtual opportunities the Society is committed to offering. So I hope you plan on joining us each week. And hearing your questions and listening to what's on your mind is going to help shape future Ask an MS Expert programs, so I hope you're ready to participate. Our objective today and our objective in all of the Ask an MS Expert programs is to connect with you, share important information that you can rely on, and provide a forum for you to connect with experts on the topics that are on your mind, the topics that really impact people affected by MS. When we read through your feedback, excuse me, but when we read through your feedback on our previous webinars and we look at the questions that we're continuing to receive, it's clear that COVID-19 will be a hot topic in all of our lives for the foreseeable future. So we're going to continue providing the latest updates on the key questions that keep coming up, as well as the new information that's trending in the news this week. Beyond just focusing on the healthcare issues associated with COVID-19, we also hear your concerns about how COVID-19 is impacting our economy. So today we'll be sharing information about the resources that are being made available through the Stimulus CARES Act. And of course, we're gonna spend time answering the questions that are on your mind. We'll also share some key resources that you can turn to anytime for credible, reliable information about COVID-19 and MS. 
before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge that these are new and rapidly evolving times. So we do have a disclaimer to review. COVID-19 is a new coronavirus, and there are currently no published data available about the virus and MS. The information and recommendations presented in this program are based upon the professional opinions of MS experts and the evidence currently available about MS, infections, and disease-modifying therapies. This is a rapidly evolving situation, and we will update information as it becomes available. The information that is shared does not substitute for your healthcare provider recommendations. Please check with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your treatment plan. And be sure to check the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 to keep up with the most updated information on MS and COVID-19. Now, let's meet our experts. Dr. Tanuja Chitnis is a board-certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis with a dual appointment at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, here in the United States. She's a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and senior scientist at the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where Dr. Chitnis created the Translational Neuroimmunology Research Center, which is focused on bringing bench discoveries to clinical trials for multiple sclerosis and related diseases. Dr. Chitnis serves on the advisory boards and steering committees of several MS-related organizations, including the National MS Society's Medical Advisory Committee, and she's written more than 200 publications and reviews related to multiple sclerosis. Stephanie Stern is the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's Associate Vice President for Advocacy and Policy. In her role, Stephanie works with government relations staff and volunteers across the country to analyze and advance public policy designed to improve the lives of people affected by MS. Prior to joining the society, Stephanie served on Capitol Hill as a legislative director for Congresswoman Gwen Moore, covering a range of issues for Congresswoman Moore, including budget and appropriations, health, education, and women's issues. And before moving to Capitol Hill, Stephanie worked for the National Partnership for Women and Families, focusing on public policies that provide support for working families. Steve Nissen is a director of MS Navigator Services Delivery at the National MS Society. In his role, Steve oversees the provision of services, information, resources, and support to people affected by MS. He also leads the nationwide work in ensuring people affected by MS connect with health insurance, benefits, and employment information and resources. Steve has been with the National MS Society since 1998, and prior to joining the society, he worked for the Virginia Department of Rehabilitative Services, the state vocational rehabilitation agency, and Steve also worked for a private vocational rehabilitation and case management company where he provided job development and placement assistance to individuals with physical disabilities. Steve has a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia, and he's a certified rehabilitation counselor. Dr. Chitnis, I'd like to start with you. Last week, we answered a lot of questions that people had around COVID-19 and MS treatments. And since last Friday's webinar, we've continued hearing from people requesting that we continue providing updates on MS and COVID-19. In particular, we're getting a lot of treatment questions and questions about what precautions people with MS should be taking to reduce their chances of getting COVID-19. What are some key things people need to know about COVID-19 and their MS medications? Yes, yeah, so thank you, John. This is a very good question. And so we at the within the MS community are just starting to learn about the effects of MS medications and in association with COVID. And, and one thing that I will say is that uh, COVID uh, infections do take different forms in different people. 
And largely the severity of infection at this point seems to be related to older age and comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. So with that background in mind, um, although we think that people with autoimmune diseases, including MS, may be at slightly higher risk, we are still amassing and gathering that data. Now, in terms of disease-modifying treatments, so there are a number of different types of disease-modifying treatments, and these might have different effects in the whole COVID situation. And also, just to give you some background, um, I consider COVID to be probably a multi-stage disease. And initially, there's about four stages that I would I'll lay out. And initially, there's uh, an infection that takes place. So there may be a lot of people who have a COVID-19 infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection, but don't necessarily have symptoms. Then the second stage is when there is an infection in the upper respiratory tract. And that's when you hear about people with cough, with loss of, uh, of smell, of loss of taste, and also cold-like symptoms and possibly fever. The third stage that I would consider is when COVID can go to the lungs. And this is obviously more severe, and this can impair uh, uh, breathing and also make you feel tired and possibly impair other things. Then the, the, the fourth stage is when there can be in some people, and not everyone, there is a what's called a cytokine storm, or basically the immune system seems to get overexcited and go out of whack. And in this stage, actually, anti-inflammatory treatments are being trialed and tested. And these include trials of drugs like uh, interferon, like fingolimod or gelenia, um, like IL-6 receptor antibodies, which are used in forms of neuromyelitis optica. So I think it's important to think about and just be aware of these different stages as we're thinking about where treatment may be affecting either your risk of catching coronavirus, COVID-19, or your risk of having a more severe disease course. So in terms of catching or getting coronavirus, I think the things that we can all do are to, uh, are to uh, physically or socially isolate and uh, be as far away from other people as possible within reason. Now, there are many of us who need to go to work, who will be in contact with others, and if we follow guidelines around social distancing, being at least six feet apart, and when we are with people wearing appropriate masks or in the case of healthcare workers, uh, personal protective equipment. So, so that's one thing that we can all do. And as well, avoid situations where we're gathering in groups. And you know, this weekend, there's a lot of holidays coming up and there's a temptation to gather in groups. But if we can resist that and find other ways to keep in touch with family, maybe virtually or um, through the phone or, or web apps, then that's the best way to ensure that you're not in touch with others. So that's probably step one. Step two around treatments in COVID. So we are starting to get some data and there is data that is coming out of Italy where they have had an earlier uh, infection with COVID or a rate of COVID infections. And at least the early data right now, and this is, again, data that has not been confirmed, it's not been published, but it seems to suggest that there is not a dramatically uh, increased or worsened rate of COVID infections in people with MS. Now, this is very early. We will see more data coming out, and I'll be looking for that very closely in the next few weeks. I think we need to confirm that, and we are in touch, uh, and the National MS Society is aware of many studies that are starting in different countries where we can gather this information. Around medications, I tell my patients it's still early to make major decisions around medications, especially stopping medications. So I encourage my patients to have a discussion with me and I'm also evaluating the risk benefit versus either changing the frequency of medications or starting or stopping different medications. There, if you're on a medication um, for MS and you are someone who is more likely to have frequent attacks and relapses, then the risk of having an attack 
getting uh, put on steroids, possibly coming to the hospital in some situations outweighs the benefit, the potential benefit of, of stopping or decreasing medication at the moment. So that's why I encourage everyone to have a conversation if they're not certain with their neurologist, with their healthcare provider who is prescribing medications for their MS to discuss that risk benefit ratio. And for the most part in my patients, I'm generally saying let's stay put on our medications for now. We will get more data in the next upcoming weeks and this will help to guide what we will do with medications. And I think on the flip side, there may be some medications that might even provide some, some benefit, but this is still early days. You know, I see that um, some of the people with us today have some specific concerns about the B cell depleting therapies, such as Ocrevus and Rituxan. Can you talk a little bit about how, what your instinct is, what you've learned about remaining on those therapies or perhaps starting those therapies right now? Yeah, so John, that's a very good question. And so the B-cell therapies, including Ocrevus and Rituxan, are, are very strong therapies. We know that they have a high uh, efficacy rate. They're very strong in terms of reducing relapse rates. If you are on these therapies, it is very possible that you are someone who is very likely to relapse. And so again, this is a conversation with your neurologist, with your MS doctor, as to what is the likelihood of you having a breakthrough relapse if you are to change the frequency of your B-cell therapy. In some situations, delaying B-cell therapy uh, infusions by one to two months, especially during this period where it might be difficult to get into your infusion unit or travel for various reasons, that might be a reasonable thing to do in some situations. So again, I'd advise you to have a conversation with your neurologist around could this be delayed for uh, one or two months, if especially if I'm having trouble in getting in and traveling. We had received a question from Nicole, whose husband is a police officer in New York, so he's in and out and everywhere these days. So first, thank you, Nicole, for the contributions your family is making to keep us all safe. Uh, so given her husband's job and what it entails, Nicole is very concerned about her risk and susceptibility as someone living with MS to COVID-19. Yeah, so, so thank you again, Nicole, for your question. And also thank you and your husband for um, his contributions to, to this pandemic and all that he's doing. So I think if you're living with someone who is uh, has the high potential to be exposed to people with COVID-19, then these are some precautions that I would advise you to take. Um, for the person who is out and about in the world and has the potential to be exposed, when he or she comes home, then I would suggest that you have a, uh, what's called a maybe a hot zone where he can change and put his clothes into maybe a, a laundry bag or a plastic bag, garbage bag, and keep his clothes there and then go up and take a shower right away. So we know that soap, will wash away coronavirus. The, the virus um, particles are very susceptible to soap. So full shower, um, washing hair, everything, et cetera, as soon as you get in the house and come home. So that's one way to help to reduce the risk of exposure. I think the other way to, uh, the other suggestions I would have are to ensure that as far as possible that um, you try to not be, um, uh, exposed to either clothes or uh, things that your partner might be uh, touching. So if he's coming home in a car, then consider cleansing or cleaning, wiping down the car if you are going to be using that car. You know, every day and, and often throughout the day, we're all being hit with information from the media around COVID-19. That constant stream of information can really feel overwhelming at times. What are some of the things that are trending in the news around COVID-19 this week that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, so, so John, I agree. I think there is a lot of news out there. Um, some of it is, uh, is somewhat confusing. 
So some of the, the highlights that we're learning about in this past week is that in many states now, um, there are recommendations and really nationally a recommendation to wear a mask if you are going out. So if you're going out to the grocery store, then recommendation is to wear a mask and continue to practice social distancing. Many grocery stores are keeping people six feet away from each other as they're entering the grocery store. There are strategies to prevent you from um, being closely in touch with the cashier. And so those are important uh, trends or really uh, guidances to follow. So wear a mask. And, um, and then the second advisory that's uh, out there now in most states is to stop non-essential travel. And I live in Massachusetts and here there is that advisory. And so uh, many people I see are, are following that as closely as possible. So try to prevent or stop any non-essential travel and also gatherings. Well, thank you, Dr. Chitness. You know, we're, we're hearing from so many people who are worried about the financial impact of COVID-19. They're concerned about losing their jobs, paying their bills, worried about accessing health care, their medications, the costs of receiving health care during this crisis, and many people have questions right now about employment rights. Uh, we've heard from Nisa, who, who wrote, now that I'm working from home, can I ask my employer for aids like a mouse or glasses that can help alleviate my MS symptoms? Uh, Debbie is asking, is MS considered an underlying condition? And, and Harold asked if there is anything he should be aware of around insurance coverage during the crisis. Well, on March 27th, the president signed the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, into law. This is the third in a series of bills that have been signed into law in response to the public health and economic impact of coronavirus in the United States. Many federal agencies have implemented new policies alongside these new laws that will provide additional funding and resources for people with MS. Stephanie Stern covers the Stimulus Care Act for the MS Society. I know, Stephanie, you and the advocacy team have been following the congressional response to COVID-19 very closely. You've also been focusing in on the parts and pieces of these new laws that could most directly benefit people affected by MS. Can you tell us about some of the pieces of this new legislation that people with MS should be most aware of? Uh, yes, and I am happy to talk about this because while the, the laws that Congress has passed are not perfect, there are a lot of provisions that should bring some relief to people right now when they need it most. Um, so, and I wanna uh, just state for the record that the most recent law was enacted just two weeks ago today. So some of the most high impact pieces are still getting off the ground. Um, we really hope to see them launch successfully in the coming weeks or even days. Um, the laws that Congress has passed include some additions around healthcare access in this time of crisis. So for example, no matter what kind of health insurance you have, if it's private coverage or Medicare or Medicaid, you can get tested for COVID-19 if you can get access to a test and all everything related to that testing um, with no out-of-pocket cost for you. Um, you also might be able to get tested if you're uninsured, depending on what state you live in. Um, but I think that what a lot of people are focusing on right now are the aspects that could help them stay financially afloat during this time. Uh, the pieces I think are affecting nearly every family in one way or another that I want to highlight so people are aware of are, um, first, there's that enhanced unemployment available. Um, this is an additional $600 a week on top of what people would already be getting from their state unemployment systems. And unemployment is gonna be available for different kinds of reasons than it normally is available. Um, there, the thing that people have heard about, I think a lot, is that there are stimulus checks going out so that people can get money in their bank accounts um, and afford basic necessities. Uh, there's mortgage and student loan relief available. There's increased access to things like paid sick days and paid leave for COVID-19 related reasons. 
Uh, and then for those who are in the greatest need, there's help paying for your utilities and funding for food banks and food assistance. Um, and I will say this probably several times today, uh, but if you have questions about any of these provisions or about your rights, I do encourage you to reach out and connect with our MS navigators who can be a great resource as you try to figure out what you personally are eligible for. Well, all of that is really good to know. I think that Congress has done more than most people assume they would, and they showed us how quickly they can actually get things done. Can you talk a little bit about how things are different state by state, and, and maybe tell us what's going on with MS advocacy in the states? Uh, yes, and I'm glad to get that question from you, John, because I know you are an MS activist. Um, so Congress did a lot. They invested heavily, literally trillions of dollars, in trying to stimulate the economy and provide a safety net for individuals and for businesses and for the states. Um, but each state is facing a completely different situation right now, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, some states' healthcare systems and safety nets were, I would say, a lot more robust than others to start. Um, and some states have more serious outbreaks. And you probably have also seen every state's governor and legislature is approaching this a little bit differently. Um, so I'm not just talking about stay at home orders and how those differ. I'm talking about how some states um, are going above and beyond what Congress is doing or what other states are doing to respond to the crisis. And this is not just happening in red and, or blue states, it's happening everywhere. So for example, depending on the state where you live, you might be protected from getting kicked off of your health coverage even if you miss paying your premiums for a month or two. Uh, depending on what state you live in, you might be eligible to enroll in health coverage through your state's Medicaid program during, at least during this time of the pandemic. Uh, some states, like my state of Minnesota, are working to try to make filing for unemployment insurance easier and quicker. Um, they've made it so you can get a 90-day uh, refill of your prescription so you don't have to keep going back to the pharmacy. Um, States have massively expanded access to telehealth um, or really any other number of um, useful things. So it's worth looking into those things. Um, and in terms of how our advocacy in the states has shifted, what we have realized is that COVID-19 illuminates all of the existing problems with our healthcare system that people with MS, affected by MS, have been aware of for many years, but are now just startlingly evident, right? So like the fact that for a lot of people, health coverage is just not affordable enough or they fall into a coverage gap so they can't uh, get coverage at all. So we have just been working hard to raise awareness uh, state by state and come up with solutions um, so people with uh, affected by MS can get what they need both, you know, right now during this crisis and moving forward. So is Congress and are the states are they still working on addressing COVID-19 or do they think their work is done now? What do we think is going to happen next? Um, good question. Um, and again, you know, our work we is never done and we keep advocating no matter what. Um, there is talk uh, that Congress will do more in the next few weeks or a few months. Uh, we didn't get our full wish list of what we would like Congress to do. Um, so we are, uh, advocating to our, the members of Congress um, and to the administration about what we'd like to see. So for example, we'd love to see them open up the federal health exchange so people can buy, more people can buy coverage. Uh, we support addressing surprise billing so that nobody is getting an enormous unexpected bill if they go out and seek treatment right now. Um, and in the states, like I mentioned, we're still full of ideas for how states can meet the specific needs of their populations. And some state legislatures have adjourned and some of them are still in session, um, but there is more action to come. And a lot of the governors are doing things by executive action or the state agencies are taking action. Um, so we're, act, we're very busy in the advocacy team right now. Um, and there will be lots of ways for people to take action with us um, moving forward. So stay tuned. Will do. Thanks, Stephanie. I think I'm going to turn to Steve Nissen. Steve covers accessing stimulus support via MS Navigator resources. Steve, given your background and experience in vocational counseling and focusing on the employment concerns of people affected by MS, 
parts of these new laws actually provide some specific protections and benefits related to employment. What sorts of questions are MS navigators receiving right now? Great, yeah, thanks, thanks, John. I mean, really, as soon as the first piece of the legislation was enacted, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, we were getting questions from folks wondering about working from home as a reasonable accommodation, paid sick leave, um, if they should continue working if they're deemed to be an essential um, worker. These are very complex questions and many times do become even more challenging if the person has not yet actually disclosed their MS diagnosis to the employer. With the CARES Act, we saw a rise in the questions dealing with applying for the unemployment benefits. Um, the uncertainty of what it's going to be like to find a new job once this immediate crisis has passed. Um, and also questions about if a care partner of someone with MS um, could tap into the expanded Family and Medical Leave Act to minimize the risk of bringing the virus home with them, um, putting their loved one with MS at, at risk. And just there are so many layers to these issues. And again, as you know, even Stephanie said, just things are changing so um, quickly. Um, so we do have a specialty team of actually MS navigators who specialize in workplace issues and employment concerns, health insurance, and disability benefits. So that team of specialized MS navigators very quickly put together resources um, and some information and tried to decipher all this information to determine the best place that we could to refer someone to um, in order to more fully understand their rights and their protections. For example, unemployment benefits do vary from state to state. So most people were going to need to uh, get in contact with their state's Department of Labor or their unemployment office. The Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA, that's a law that um, that, that is administered through the US Department of Labor. The Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, um, is really kind of the preeminent source, um, source of information regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they have developed some wonderful resource materials and publications um, in regard to reasonable accommodations during this COVID crisis. So really we worked hard um, within the MS Navigator team, especially our benefits and employment support team to consolidate all this information um, into you know, an easy to understand manner and determine ways to convey this information to the constituents who are connecting with us. I'm just curious, um, if someone is now working from home uh, due to a stay-at-home order, can they still request a special accommodation through their employer? They should be able to, correct. Um, so, and again, the Job Accommodation Network is one of the best resources. Um, we definitely saw um, an increase in terms of requests about maybe if somebody was not already working from home and they wanted to request that as an accommodation. Um, that they do have the rights under the ADA if their employer, again, there's some, there's very kind of specific uh, criteria that um, the employer would need to meet. But um, if that um, em employee works for um, an, an employer who does follow the ADA, they do have the right to continue to request to request reasonable accommodations during during this time. You know, this isn't the first time I've said this, but I think that the MS Navigators are the best team of problem solvers in the world for people who are affected by MS. Can you tell us how MS Navigators have been supporting people affected by MS, specifically during this time of uncertainty? Definitely, yes, I would love to. So, you know, our team of MS Navigators have been fielding so many questions from people affected by MS since this entire COVID crisis started. Um, I would say, first of all, we really strive hard to provide just the emotional support. Um, we know that this is a very scary time. Um, all of us are learning more day by day, and it can just feel very um, overwhelming. 
Um, there's a lot of uh, tension, some anxiety out there, and sometimes people just really need to have a listening ear. So um, we can be that to folks. Um, we can also connect them to some of the other resources that may be available to help them feel more connected. We have um, definitely also been working very closely with the other teams, um, especially those in Stephanie's department, to more fully understand and interpret all of these protections and benefits and be able to explain what's available and how people would be able to get access to them. Really, you know, like all the while though, the MS Navigators have been have continued to provide support and information and resources to requests that are non-COVID, uh, not non-COVID related. Um, though this has definitely been such a focus um, of the requests that we've been getting, I think that it's important to know that people are still contacting uh, the society wanting to connect with an MS Navigator for a variety of different reasons, whether they're newly diagnosed or they're considering changing treatments, looking for some help in the home, um, looking to maybe get referred to a new doctor, needing a piece of durable medical equipment and wondering where they can get it from and how they might be able to afford it. So those calls continue as well. Um, so really our team of MS Navigators uh, continue to be ready to help, to provide the direct support um, and or point people in the right direction. Since so many people are contacting the Society for COVID-related support and information, how has the MS Navigator team been staying up to date in what's a very dynamic and constantly evolving situation? Definitely. I mean, and again, like I said, we are learning things. <laughs> we feel like almost day by day, some days even like minute, minute by minute. Um, so, you know, the National MS Society first really we've really stressed ourselves on the importance of communication and keeping our staff you know kind of like up up to date on the latest um the latest information so um really when this crisis started the society conducted a covid 19 staff training that was really for you know all of the national ms society staff um we continue to receive some updates information you know, on a regular basis, really stressing that importance of information sharing and communicating out this information, being receptive to questions when we, as staff, as the MS Navigator team, need to seek some clarification. Um, our various specialty teams within kind of the MS Navigator um, have been doing research on COVID-19 and their specific focus so they've taken care to share what they learn with the full MS Navigator team, created documents and resources to support them. These can include things like financial resources or financial assistance resources, whether it's related to delaying, delaying the evictions or getting a utility assistance, um, trying to identify the best supports when people contact us and they might be experiencing um, a crisis. Um, and looking at ways to continue to deliver our case management services um, from a virtual perspective to those who need that level of support. We are also, to be honest, John, focusing on self-care, self-care for ourselves, for our teammates, um, as well as uh, just discussing it with the constituents who are contacting us. We continue to work directly with our colleagues across the National MS Society. So our colleagues in the society's research departments, the healthcare access department, the advocacy team, um, really as well as looking at ways to incorporate the latest information that we're hearing from the CDC and from the MSIF, the, multi the Multiple Sclerosis International uh, Federation, um, to be sure that we have the most current, um, relevant, and um, up-to-date information that we can share with the constituents who are contacting us. Well, Steve, I have a question for you from Jeff, who wants okay. to know, he, Jeff wants to know how long will unemployment cover a part-time worker to be out per doctor's order to self-quarantine? Jeff, that's a very good question. One that I actually wish that I knew a concrete answer for. Um, but the challenge, or really the reality is, is that, um, 
the, um, the unemployment benefits are going to vary from state to state. So the best resource that I could suggest to you, Jeff, is to get in touch with your local, the unemployment office, because they sh should be able to provide clarification um, in terms of duration of those benefits, process. Um, the, the, you, can, you can find that information. You can definitely feel free to contact an MS Navigator. Um, we do have a state-by-state -state listing of those State Department of Labor's or the employ or the unemployment offices, um, job accommodation network, which again is a resource that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago. Um, Jan does also have um, on their website um, a listing of all of the states, the state's unemployment office. So that could be yet another place to um, turn. And their website is actually uh, www. Uh, dot, um, um, ask Jan. Dot org, and then there's a link to um, uh, resources, and that's where you can find contact information for them. Well, Steve, Amber writes that she's still working at her workplace, but feels that she could do her job at home and would prefer to do that. She's never disclosed her MS to her employer. What rights does Amber have in the workplace in order to hopefully transition to work from home? This is a very uh, good question, Amber, and there's a lot of different layers to it because we know that um, disclosure of uh, disclosure of, of a disability, disclosure of um, your MS is is probably one of the most stressful um, questions or situations that a person might grapple with. Um, so in terms of the rights that uh, you would have, so depending on the size, the size and type of the employer, um, you very well may be protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. I know I mentioned that just a couple minutes ago. Um, but what that law is, is it's designed to protect against discrimination of people with disabilities um, in a variety of different settings, but especially in the workplace and does also um, give qualified employees with disabilities the right to request a reasonable accommodation. Telework may be considered or work at home may be considered to be um, a reasonable accommodation, but in order to tap into the protections of that law, in order to request those accommodations, um, an employee does first need to actually disclose that they've got a disability. Um, you may or may not need to provide an actual medical diagnosis. So this is a very big decision to make, um, one that you would really want to make after you fully get um, educated about the pros and cons, different ways that you might want to, uh, to approach this request with your employer and determine how best to make that specific um, uh, the request. Again, I'll give a plug here again, the Job Accommodation Network. They are a great source, um, a great source of expert information about uh, the ADA. Um, on their website, they do have a sample accommodation uh, request letter. Um, and uh, again, you can uh, feel free to jump on their website, www.askjan.org. Um, we would also strongly encourage you just to contact an MS Navigator. Again, we can be reached on Android. I, I, I do know, John, that, that you're going to share this number again later, but it seems right to share it here too. Um, feel free uh, to give us a call to, to, connect, to connect with an MS Navigator at 1-800-344-4867. Um, um, we do have a slew um, like of information about disclosure, about accommodations, about legal protections um, that you may be able um, to avail yourself of. So again, this is a very complex situation. Disclosure is kind of the underlying step before you could request that as reasonable accommodation. So hopefully the more research, the more support that you can get will help guide the decision that feels right to you and that will hopefully um, ultimately lead to a, a successful employment outcome. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions for Stephanie. So Stephanie, let me ask you, or I should say Beth is asking you, a two-part question. 
do couples get one check or separate checks in terms of the stimulus payment? And Beth would also like to know, how does she update her banking information with the IRS? Okay, um, it's a good question. I actually looked this up because I knew I would not be able to, I'm not an IRS expert, but I found the answer. So if you don't wanna deal with a paper check, there is an option to get that, the $1,200 check direct deposited. If you already gave the uh, IRS your bank account information for your tax refund, your stimulus account will be automatically deposited to that account. Um, if you don't have a direct deposit set up with the IRS, the IRS says they're gonna set up a new web portal so you can set up your direct deposit. I have not seen that happen yet, but stay tuned for that. Um, and if we get Beth's email address, I can maybe like, if I find it, I'll give it to her. Um, and you, if you're, if you usually get your refund by mail, um, the checks are going to be sent to the address listed in your last tax return. Um, so, it, and if that's incorrect, if you, or if you haven't filed yet this year, you moved, you do have to tell the IRS your current address, and that's a not available to do online. You have to do it by a form and mail it, or you call them. Um, and then the check or the deposit um, is will be combined to, into one check if you file jointly. Thanks, Stephanie. You know, we're seeing a lot of questions about rumors that access to care could be rationed in the event that healthcare resources like ventilators are scarce and that people with chronic health conditions and disabilities may not have equal access to the care they need. Um, Stephanie, can you speak a little bit to what the society is doing to ensure that people living with MS are served by the healthcare system the same as everyone else? Uh, yes. Um, and so, um, you, as you may have heard, just to give a little more background, some states or communities are getting to that point of feeling overwhelmed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and some states are and hospitals have developed over the years plans for how to ration care if the number of critically ill coronavirus patients exceeds capacity, meaning who will get access to life-saving treatment. Um, some of these things are brand new and some have this guidance that's been around for a long time and we're just finding it now. And just to underscore, this is guidance that would only apply in situations where resources are stretched beyond the max, which is not where most states are. Uh, but the problem is that these treatment rationing protocols are often, um, they take into consideration things like your health status or people or, or disability. Um, so the disability rights advocacy community, which includes the Multiple Sclerosis Society, is going through, reading through state by state, um, the guidance that states have um, and making sure that under these this guidance, people with chronic health conditions and disabilities will get equal access. There are bad examples out there of states um, uh, where they have guidance on the books. We don't know who, where it came from or who wrote it. Um, some of these are like in a drawer and have been around since the SARS epidemic. Um, but some of them say, uh, use some discriminatory language implying that people with conditions, with serious health conditions shouldn't get equal access to treatment. So we um, have been working to contact state health officials and governor's offices to uh, provide guidance for um, how they should, first of all, get rid of those uh, discriminatory guidelines and uh, uh, reissue non-discriminatory guidelines. Um, the Office, the Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights is also, has also issued guidance telling states they cannot issue discriminatory guidelines. So there's a lot going on in this space right now, but it's, um, it is up to us and the people we work with just to make sure that all the states have appropriate and non-discriminatory guidance um, in place. So that's what we're working on right now. And Stephanie, Teresa asks, what can she do to help out with our advocacy work and get involved as an MS activist? This is our favorite question. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so the simplest answer is to stay tuned and join our MS activist networks. So you can get updates. We're gonna be asking people to send messages to Congress. Uh, many of you have maybe already done that, so thank you. Um, but there will be uh, other additional requests coming out in the next few, couple weeks. So um, then I'm not sure of the timeline. Uh, we're also doing some action alerts asking for what we need uh, in the states. So for example, those states that have an uh, expanded Medicaid, asking them to, the governors to make that happen as soon as possible. So thank you for that question. 
And thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Dr. Chitnis, I'd like to uh, bring you in. We have a few questions that I think you are best to address. Um, Timothy says, I take a disease modifying therapy. I'm worried there may be issues with availability of my meds in the future. Is there any news on that? So, so Timothy, so far I have not seen or heard of any uh, lack of availability or difficulty in ordering disease modifying treatments for multiple sclerosis. Uh, however, I think it is prudent to, to think about this question and if it is possible to order a three month supply as opposed to a one month supply of medications, then that is something that maybe I would suggest that you and other people with MS think about doing. Jesse wants to know, does COVID-19 affect certain ethnicities or, or specific groups of people worse than others? So, so thank you for that question. And this is something that we're still learning about. And at least so far, um, to my knowledge, there's not a, a difference in terms of susceptibility to COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus for people from different ethnicities. What may be different is the transmissibility and also um, maybe the practice of social distancing in different communities. So that might influence what we're seeing in some cities uh, like New York, where there seems to be a disproportionately number of um, people of color affected. So I think social distancing is key. And this is probably the factor that is most responsible for any disparities that we're currently seeing. Uh, we have a uh, an anonymous questioner uh, who is going for their Tysabri infusion and wants to know how they can best protect themselves besides PPE. Yes, yeah, so, so I presume that you're going to an infusion unit for your Tysabri infusion. And I think it is good to ensure that the infusion unit, the hospital is taking all precautions to, um, to cleanse in between patients who are using that chair or that uh, space. And most hospitals are, but I think it doesn't hurt to ask that question. And then for you, as you're going into the center, so uh, wearing a mask is important, um, washing your hands frequently if you want to wear gloves, that's not unreasonable because that also might help to prevent you from touching your face. So during the, the infusion, I think you know, nurses are very careful and uh, very well aware to, uh, to, um, to take precautions in between patients. Um, and I think uh, in general, it is a safe experience in most infusion units. Karen says that since there are so many options out there for different types of masks, is there a best option other than the N95, which should be saved for the doctors and nurses? And she also wants to know if it's been determined uh, whether there are best materials available for commercial or homemade masks. Yeah, so Karen, this is a very good question. And so currently the guidance from the, from the CDC and on various governmental websites for masks uh, for people who are not in the healthcare professions is to use two layers of 100% cotton. So if you have a cotton t-shirt or cotton material around, then this could be used for a mask. I think it's also important to ensure that it covers your nose and mouth fully and also drapes underneath the chin and this helps to prevent transmission both from you and to you. Jerry would like to know whether there are any types of household over-the-counter drugs to have on hand or supplements to be using to help ward off COVID-19. Yeah, so, so at the moment, um, I don't recommend self-medicating for COVID-19. Uh, especially with some of the, the stronger drugs that may be out there. For upper respiratory tract or cold or fever symptoms, I think we all use uh, entities like Tylenol uh, for fever, and I would probably recommend using at this point Tylenol for fever 
uh, in this in this in the in the event or in the possibility that this could be COVID-19. There is some suggestion that it might be um, a, a useful agent. And uh, above and beyond that, I, I wouldn't recommend any other medications specifically for this virus. I think other measures to help you can feel more comfortable, um, such as uh, analgesics or uh, even things to suppress cough are okay to use. Um, beyond that, rest, sleep, a healthy diet as far as possible are probably our most important preventative measures. Thank you, Dr. Chitness. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you, and these are resources that you can count on to be current and to be credible. The National MS Society's MS Navigator team is available to answer your questions and connect you to the specific resources that can best help you. You can reach an MS Navigator through the Society's website or by email at contactusnmss at nmss.org or by telephone at 1-800-344-4867. For more information on the Stimulus CARES Act, you can visit the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash CARES, C-A-R-E-S. And I should add that if you have the Real Talk MS app installed on your smartphone or tablet, you can check the bonus content tab and you'll see that you've already received the MS Society's detailed document on the Stimulus CARES Act as it applies to people affected by MS. And if you don't yet have the Real Talk MS app installed, well, you can download it from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You can always check the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 for the latest updated information on COVID-19 and MS. And you'll also find a great FAQ document there that's just loaded with information. You can also visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website at cdc.gov for the latest information about COVID-19 from the federal government. I also want to let you know that this is our fourth Ask an MS Expert webinar. And if you'd like to review the past webinars, you'll find the video replays at the MS Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash MS Expert. And please make sure that MS Expert is all one word. Finally, every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversations that we start here. So I hope you take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You can find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you find your audio content. Well, let me say thank you to Dr. Chitness, Stephanie, and Steve for sharing your knowledge and insights with us today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continually improve and it helps shape future webinars. Now, the survey only takes one minute and it really makes a huge difference. So please take a moment to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Tanusha Chitness, Stephanie Stern, Steve Nesson, and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.